Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? We've got something special for you today. I hope you're excited. Hey, but before we dive in, if you're brand new at any one of our locations, we want to take a moment to say welcome to you. Can we give it up for all of our first-time guests today? So glad you're here. Whatever campus you're joining us at, Greenwood, Banta, Franklin, Seymour, if you're joining us at one of our micro sites, Garfield Park, wherever you are, if you're watching at home, we want to thank you for tuning in. If you're a guest, if you're not brand new, welcome back. Good to see you as well. We are wrapping up a series today called Who's Counting? It's the first series of 2023. I think it's been fun so far. Have you guys had fun? Has it been helpful? Uh, hope, okay, I'm not so sure. Like, yeah. I, one thing I can't stand is golf claps. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, no, it had, if you're going to clap, clap. No, anyway, hopefully it's been a blessing to you, and we're going to close that out today. What we've been talking about in this series uh, is really it's this simple idea that, that counting is valuable. Counting is, 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 uh, is important in our life. It gives us feedback, lets us know where we are when we count certain things, and it creates this idea of consistency. When you count something, it creates a habit. Once you create great habits in your life, then you can really end up changing your life. People love to count stuff. Have you noticed? People, I mean, it's incredible what people count. Yeah, I saw some research, the researchers the other day that decided that they wanted to count how fast your finger goes when you snap your finger. Can we all do that together real quick? Can we just all like snap our fingers? Like it's, it's, it's pretty, okay. I know some of us are too cool for school. We're like, I ain't doing it. I know, I know. It's amazing. So they got these, these cameras out, these special cameras to be able to like slow your finger down when you snap it. Uh, And it turns out that when you snap your finger, you're doing the fastest thing you've ever done in your life. When you snap your fingers, your finger is traveling at seven millionths of a second or seven milliseconds. That's the right phrase, seven milliseconds. I don't even know how to describe how fast that is. Now, if you want to know how fast that is, just, just blink with me really quick. Just do that. Just really, everybody blink together. Come on, even the cool kids. Come on, come on. Blink with me. Okay, when you snap your fingers, you, that's seven times faster than your, no, that's 20 times faster than your eyes blinking. Is that incredible? That's how fast you're, it's the fastest thing you'll ever do in your life. Some of you are gonna be snapping your fingers for the rest of your life. Watch out fast, watch out fast. Why do we know that? I have no idea. Like people love to count stuff that it's totally irrelevant. <laughs> I saw another uh, group of people that decided they to count how long it would take a person to walk around the moon. Okay, so it turns out if you walk at 3.1 miles an hour, it'll take you 91 days to walk around the moon. Now, nobody walks constantly for 91 days, so let's just say you walked for about four hours a day at 3.1 miles an hour. It would take you 547 days or a year and a half to get around the moon, which, again, I'm reading this, and it's sort of fascinating. I'm like, but who cares? (laughs) <laughs> like, it's irrelevant, but people just love to count stuff. You know, I saw somebody the other day as well. They decided that they wanted to count how many variations there are in when you shuffle a deck of cards. I'm going to attempt to shuffle a deck of cards here, see if we can do this really quick. I tried. It wasn't very good at 9 o'clock. So, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Let's not try that. How about this? Because another way to shuffle is just to kind of drop the cards on the ground. You want to do that real Is that easier? Well, that would make a mess, too. Let's try to shuffle. Let's try to shuffle. <laughs> okay, let's go back to this. Let's see if we can do it. Oh, it was terrible. Come on, cheer me on a little bit. I got to do this. There we go. Crowd participation is always helpful. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Okay, that was fine. Much, much better. 
I am not gonna start a side hustle of hustling, of gambling on the side or playing poker. So anyway, um, but some, they, discovered, they discovered that if you shuffle a deck of cards, there is a likelihood, this is incredible, I don't know how they figured this out, there is a likelihood that you will put these cards in, in some order that has never been seen before on the face of the planet. That's how many different variations of 52 cards you can have. I'm like, that's pretty cool. But who cares? <laughs> I mean, people are counting stuff that, that is totally irrelevant. And so in this series, we've been trying to count stuff that actually matters. You know, like, hey, let's improve our attitude and let's, like, improve our finances. Last week, we talked about the, the money. Then we talked about improving our health and fitness. Stuff that really matters to all of you. Things that appear at the top of a list of New Year's resolutions. And so that's what I want to do again today. What makes counting a good thing. In your notes, we've been talking about this. Counting is a good thing. Your digital notes there. Counting is a good thing when we are tracking the progress that God wants us to make. We're talking about things that, that, that the Lord is wanting for us. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us, our finances to be in order. He wants us to have the same attitude at his, as his son, Jesus Christ. These are things that God wants for us. Counting can be a bad thing if you start counting stuff, even good things, for the wrong reasons. And we saw that in King David's life when he took a census and counted all the people in Israel and God punished him and his people for doing that. Counting is a good thing when we're tracking the progress that God is leading us to make. So today, let's talk about this final kind of topic that, that uh, I believe that people want to improve in their life. In fact, this topic I want to talk to you about today appears most of the time in, in the top five New Year's resolutions every year that people set, and that is relationships, relationships. Here's how it usually appears in a New Year's resolution. This year, I want to spend more time with my loved ones, right? I want to I wanna improve my relationships. That's how it usually appears. Why does this appear in most lists of New Year's resolutions? I believe because people know, or it's intuitive, it's sort of common knowledge that you should be investing in relationships, that the quality of our lives really is the result of our closest relationships. I believe that people know that intuitively. They just know it. It's, like a, it's in them, and so they know they've been neglecting the relationships, and the relationships in their life, the closest ones, are kind of you know, maybe spiraling out of control or losing some of their, you know, the, the, the value, and they're like, man, I need to, I need to get better at that. I need to be closer to my spouse. I need to invest more in my son. I need to work on my friendships. I need to, I need to, this year's gonna be different. I'm gonna invest in my relationships. And so people write that down as a New Year's resolution. And we know we should do it. But you know what we end up doing? (laughs) Instead of investing in relationships, we end up spending more time at work. Instead of going home and investing in our families. Just an extra hour, maybe two, get some more stuff done. Instead of investing in relationships, we scroll on social media. I saw some stats the other day. It said the average American right now is spending two hours and 27 minutes a day on social media. Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, blah, 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 blah. That's about 17 and a half hours a week, which is a part-time job on social media. Hope you're enjoying yourself. Times that by, you know, four or a month, you're at 70 hours a month. Times that by a year, you're at 800, over 800 hours in a year. Doing what? Doing what? Doing this right here. (laughs) Like, like, post, post, like, like. 840 hours. You know what 840 hours translates to in weeks? For a year, five weeks, 840 hours, 168 hours a week. That's what the average American is spending on this stupid thing right here. That's not even counting Netflix or television or any any form of television you watch. That's just social media. And then we write at the top of the list, oh, I need to invest in my relationships. It's It's hard to find time. Really? It's hard to find time? Get off of social media, dummy. Can I say that in a loving way? Because <laughs> you know I love you. I just, I just do. You know, I understand some of you have to do it for work or what, but limit it, limit it. Get ready to get off that thing. Invest in your relationships. Instead of, instead of investing in relationships, we work more. We spend time on social media. We spend time on our hobbies. We play video games. Video games? Come on. Some of you are 45. You're playing video games. Come on. <laughs> Come on. 
We gotta leave that stuff in the past. We gotta do adult things. We gotta invest in people, things that matter. Now, now, okay, is, is video games a sin? No, come on, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, this is what we write on the list. And then we go play video games, right? We've gotta invest in our relationships. Here's, here's what I've come to realize, is that the, the, the quality of my life today, what it is what it is because of, of it's a result of, of my marriage and my friendships. Like the, the, the joy and the fulfillment that I experience today is a result of the incredible people that are around me adding value to my life. So I wanna share a couple of thoughts with you today. Like how would we actually do that? You know, the Bible actually says this so clearly in a book of Ecclesiastes. Listen to what it says. It says, two people are better off than one. Why? For they can help each other succeed. In other words, you can get further faster with some good friends. If one person falls down, they can reach out and help. But someone who's in, who falls in alone, alone is in real trouble. In other words, hey, a friend is there to help you up when, you, when you're down and when you fall. Right now, some of you may have heard about the, the, the plane accident that happened. I just heard about it. Uh, a young woman passed away in, in, last week here in Indianapolis on a, on, a, on a plane. Well, her friends are here today. In fact, her best friend's here today. I don't know where she is, but she's here today. Guess what? Her friends came up to me and said, hey, could you pray for her? Will you pray for her? I said, absolutely. Bring her down after the service. We'll pray for her. Her friends did that, came to me to give her support. Again, I don't know where you are, where you're sitting, but we, we want you to know you're cared for and love. I'm gonna pray for you after the service. That's what friends do. They, they help each other up when they're down, but woe to the person who doesn't have anybody in their life when they, when they, have a, when they go through a fall. And then uh, he, Solomon continues, likewise, two people lying close to, together can keep each other warm, but how can one stay warm alone? Now, we don't do that sort of thing today unless you're married, um, and we have other ways, but, but the principle of, is this. When you need help, someone's there to give you what you need whether that's encouragement or some financial help. And then Solomon continues. He says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but a person who's standing back to back can conquer. In other words, when you're in a tight-knit group of, of people who love you and care about you, you can defend yourself when someone attacks you. And then Solomon closes with this beautiful verse. Three are even better, for a triple-braided cord is not easily broken. Man, if you got one best friend, you're, you're set. You got two you're solid. This book teaches, man, this teaches you've got to have great relationships. And so I want to talk to you today about a couple of ideas that can help you to improve your relationships. So if you if you got your phone out, you're taking some digital notes, or if you've got a notebook, write these down. The first thing you have to do to improve your relationship is to make the relationship a priority. Make the relationship a priority. Now, we've got this idea of priority mixed up today in America. We really do. If you look up the word, the definition of the word priority in the dictionary, it says something that is more important than something else. <laughs> something that is more valuable than something else. But in America today, here's what we've done. We've gone from talking about a priority to what? To priorities, which is ironic, isn't it? Because the very definition of the word priority means that, it, that it's, it's more important, it's more valuable. But then we, have, we talk about, well, what are your three priorities this week? Or what are your five priorities at work? It's like, wait a second, that's not what the word means. <laughs> if you have a priority, it's more valuable than something else. But if you have five and they're all equal, you're not focused on anything. Is this making sense? We have to make the relationship, whether it's a relationship with a son, a daughter, a brother, a sister, a, a wife, a husband, a friend, whoever it is, a coworker, a teammate, we have to make the relationship, if we want to improve it, a priority. That means it has to rise above spending time at work. It has to rise above spending time with another person. It has to rise above video games. It has to rise above spending time on social media. It has to become the priority. It has to become more important. How do you do that? Really simple. You make, you give the relationship time. That's it. In a relationship, love is spelled time. Lots of time. Some of us think, well, I give quality time. I don't give quantity of time. I give quality of time. Wrong, wrong. In order to get quality time, you have to give quantity of time. It doesn't, you can't just orchestrate quality time. It, it's a byproduct of having quantity of time. Does that make sense? And so you have to give the relationship lots and lots of time because that reveals that it's important to you. How, do I, how am I going to know what's important to you and how are you going to know what's important to me? All you have to do is look at my schedule. If you got my phone for some strange reason and you looked up in my, in my schedule and I do have all my, my meetings and my whole days planned and all my weeks are planned and, and Jenny helps me with that, and my wife helps me with that, you're going to see what's important to me because time never lies. 
Time reveals what your priorities are. So where's the relationship? Oh, there's my code. Where's the, where's the relationship on your schedule? Time, right? Some of you know we canceled Saturday services a couple weeks ago. And for 10 years, we've been doing, over 10 years, we've been doing Saturday services, which means, and for many of those years, we did a, a four o'clock and a six o'clock, which means for most of my life, for the last decade or more, I've been here on Saturdays, which is great. It's awesome. It's helped build a church, and it's been a wonderful thing. Help us get multi-site launch, all that stuff. Well, now Saturdays are gone, so guess what? Guess what I have on my hands? Time. And I'm like, hmm, what are we going to do with this time? I've never had this time before. So two Saturdays ago, uh, it was actually last Saturday, I said, honey, what do you think if we just went to go see a movie? Just, just, just a matinee, four o'clock, and then after that we went to lunch, and then after that we went to wherever you want to go. And she looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> she looked at me like I was an alien. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I got a lot of time. And you, my sweet love, and this daughter that we have, who's 18, is about ready to leave the nest. Amen. Excited. <laughs> She's going to sk- sk- skedaddle off to Liberty University with her brothers, and mom and dad are going to have an empty nest. But, but we only have so many Saturdays left, so let's go. Let's go. She's like, okay. So we get the movie tickets, and we get the lunch set up, and we get the, you know. So we go see this movie. It's, it's great. The three of us treating my ladies to this, this date, you know, and then we go have some food. And then I'm like, well, what else do you want to do? You know, I'm thinking, let's go shopping. And then they really thought I was crazy. <laughs> and she says, well, you know, I could really use something from, from uh, Ulta. I'm like, what's Ulta? I don't know. I've never been to Ulta. So, so there we go. Drive over. We drive over, and, and I'm pulling up. It's like, oh, that's Ulta. I've never seen that store before. And so we go in. We go in, and, and it's just like feminine world. You know, just, 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 just complete, just everything feminine in the whole world, right? And so I'm walking around like, oh, gosh, how did I get talked into, the, into this? You know, people are spraying things, and I'm smelling. I sm- and sure enough, my wife finds something she wants, and I'm like, I'm buying it, because this is time. I'm loving you. I'm loving on you. I'm looking at my daughter. What do you want? You know, I'm going to buy you something. And, and so I buy a few things, and then we get out of there. <laughs> and I'm like, when I left, I was like, man, I got to, like, scratch myself or burp or do some push-ups or something manly, <laughs> because I feel way too feminine right now. <laughs> And so then we went to TJ Maxx and did some more shopping. And, you know, it was, it was a great day. It was a great day. It was a great day. Here's why I did that. Here's why I did that. Because I wanted to tell my wife and my daughter, you guys are the priority in my life. And I have not done that enough. When you neglect that, man, it's, a, it's just a matter of time before someone feels devalued and they know they're not the priority. And that explains why some of your relationships are, are not where they need to be. Does it make sense? So what are we going to count? What are we going to count? This series is about counting. We're going to count the hours together. Count the hours together. All the research has been done on this. John Gottam wrote a book called Seven Principles for Making Your Marriage Work. This isn't a marriage talk. This is a relationship talk, but this is really good. Our, some of us, uh, our primary relationship is our marriage. He talks about how couples who excel each year in their marriage are spending at least six hours together per week. Now, there's 168 hours in a week. Surely we can find six hours with our best friends or our spouses or husbands, right? And so he just talks about how they do that. Six hours. One of the things he talks about is greetings, uh, departures and greetings. And my wife have got this sort of figured out. We've got the date night thing figured out. Uh, and, and the greeting. Here, here's what he talks about in, in, in the greeting and departures. He says, make sure that when you're about ready to leave the house, there is a moment. There is a coming together like, hey, I'm about ready to go to work and it's good, you know, what's on your schedule and I love you and let me, you know, let's have a kiss <laughs> and let's, let's embrace. And, and so I, that's exactly what we do. Every time I leave the house, I, I make sure that there's a moment. I got my jacket on, my car's running, my shoes are on, I got my, my bag and I'm like, okay, honey, come on over here, come on over here. Kiss me, kiss me. <laughs> and sometimes that kiss gets a little bit, you know, a little bit risque, you know, depending on who's around. Because I want her to know. I want her to know. I'm leaving you for the day, but I love you. And then we also do that when I come home. Well, the dog usually gets to me first, but then it's Jackie. <laughs> and there's an embrace. How are you? It's good to see you. Let's talk. Some of you dudes, listen, some of you guys, you leave the house. Maybe some of you ladies as well. You leave the house. You don't even say goodbye. It's just a matter of time before that spouse of yours is like, 
peace. How can you leave the house without saying goodbye? How can you come home without a greeting, an embrace, right? Six hours a week. That's all it takes to improve your key relationships. Okay, I could do a whole sermon just on that one, but we don't, we're out of time, so we got to move on. So what are we going to do? We're going to prioritize the relationship. What else are we going to do? We're going to add value to the relationship. Relationships work well when it's a give and take. You can't be a taker all the time. If you're a taker from the relationship all the time, that relationship is doomed. I'm just telling you, some of you have lived that. You've gone through this. You've paid the price because you were a taker. You've got to come to the table in a relationship and add lots and lots of value. What am I talking about? I'm talking about encouragement. I'm talking about money. I'm talking about words of affirmation. I'm talking about time together. I just talked about that. Bringing value to the relationship, helping with chores. I never want my wife or the people in my life to, 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 to see me walk through the door and go, oh, he's here. And he's going to take more. Like my wife has done a great job raising our children, staying at home, and, and, and all that stuff. I never wanted to walk through the door and her to, to have this feeling like, oh, I've got three kids, and the fourth one just walked through the door. Because <laughs> he's just going to take more and more, and, and I don't have anything left to give. So I'm just trying to come in and say, what can I do to add value to you? Can I take something off your plate? Can I unload the dishwasher? Can I do something to make your life better? This is, what we're, this is how you make great relationships. You give. You add value. The Apostle Paul was writing to his young protege, Timothy. Listen to what he says in Titus, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 14. He gave him life. Jesus gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people. Watch this. Watch this. Totally committed to doing, say it with me, good deeds. Did you know that you were saved by Jesus Christ to be his child, his son, his daughter for the purpose of adding value? Did you know that? Like you're not supposed to be just saved and then sit around and be a taker. Gimme, 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 hand out all the time. Like you were saved you became one of his kids so that you could be totally committed, totally devoted to adding value to others. Whoa, that's the purpose of your life, is to add value to others. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he, when he went on his first missionary journey, he took a guy named John Mark who had to be in his 20s. And he took him on this missionary journey, and John didn't pull his weight. So on the second missionary journey, he gets in, Paul gets into an argument with Barnabas and he's like, I'm not taking John Mark. He's too heavy. He's not pulling his weight. Barnabas and, and Paul get into an argument. Barnabas is like, come on, give him another chance. Paul's like, nope, he ain't coming on my ship. Whatever. And he doesn't say what John Mark did. Maybe he was lazy. Maybe he was selfish. Maybe he was greedy. I don't know. It, Paul just says he ain't coming on my ship. We did, we did one tour of duty together, not doing another one. Well, then Barnabas and Paul split, and Barnabas takes John Mark with him because he believes in him. Well, evidently, some years go by, and John Mark and Paul sync up again, and Paul sees a different guy, and they end up doing ministry together. In fact, they get separated again about 10 years later, and this is what Paul wrote about John Mark to, to Timothy. He says, Luke is with me. He's the only one with me, so I want you to go get John Mark. Shortened his name. Go get Mark and bring him with me. Bring him with you, for he is, say it with me, useful. For what? For me in ministry. Apparently something changed about John Mark. He started to realize the error of his own ways or his selfishness or his greed or his laziness or whatever it was. And he started to be a person who became useful. Can I tell you something? You're supposed to be useful in your friendships. You are supposed to add value. When you do that, man, you're going to have so many friends. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to cancel some friends. You're going to be so valuable that people are like, hey, can we be friends? Can we be friends? I want to be friends. You're like, ah, okay, I already got too many. Can't. In fact, there's a waiting list. If you'd like to go to dannyanderson.com, you can get on the waiting list. I'm just kidding. It's not like that. But, man, people are going to want to be your friend. Why? Because what? you just add value to everybody. 
You're looking at needs and you're seeing what people need around you and you're meeting those needs and you're doing that. I love, I, my favorite relationship verse in the Bible is Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Watch this. Outdo. Go beyond. Go, go to the next level in showing honor. Wow. Can you imagine if you did that in your relationships? Your relationships would go through the roof. And I'm telling you, the quality of your life is a result of your closest relationships. So what are we going to count? We're going to count value added. We're going to count weekly value added. Just put it in your little journal. Put it in the notes in your phone. You write down the things or the ways that you add value to the closest people in your life. I'm telling you, it's going to send your relationships to another level. So we're going to, number one, we're going to prioritize our relationships. Number two, we're going to add value. Number three, we're going to eliminate the thorns. This may be the most important one. See, here's what the truth about you. It's hard to hear, but it's also true about me, is that there are things about you that others don't like. Okay, can we smile? <laughs> it's hard to hear this, but we got to talk about it because I love you. I love you. I care about you. I need to say this to you. There's things about you that you're doing that the people closest to you cannot stand. They're thorns. And they poke people. Ow. Ooh. Eh. Get away from me. You can be at times a porcupine. <laughs> you ever try to grab a porcupine when it's upset? No, you don't. You get away from those things, right? What are the thorns in your life? Are you just constantly yapping? People don't like that. Hey, newsflash, people don't like your voice that much. <laughs> they don't like your opinion that much. You think they do. They don't. Whoosh. Maybe your words are critical. Everything you say is critical, critical, talking about the kids and this and the house and the dog. And whatever. I'm just telling you. There's only so much people can put up with that, the negativity and the criticism. Maybe you're passive aggressive. There's only so much people can put up with that. Thorns. What are your thorns? Do you one up people? Somebody's trying to tell a story and they're really excited about it. They had this experience and they're, like, they're so excited to tell you about it. And they're bearing their heart and they're sharing this story. And all of a sudden, you got a better story. That's not smart. <laughs> you, you constantly one up people? Uh uh. They want to get away from you. Does that make sense? Some, some of you, you have to understand this stuff. You have thorns. What thorns are making your relationships difficult? Are you greedy? Are you selfish? Do you always talk about yourself? Is the story always about you? Years ago, I was challenged to think about this question, and I still do it today. What's it like to be on the other end of me? It's not always a pleasant experience. Are you one of those people? And I tend to be this way. I tend to be this way. I walk into a room and I'm like, everybody's glad to see me. I'm here. I tend to be that way because I'm happy and I think everybody's happy. And I'm like, I'm happy. Aren't you, don't you want to be around somebody's happy? I'm happy. Some people don't. Some people get so sick of my smile. I mean, <laughs> I had someone leave this church one time. They were in the balcony here at the Greenwood campus, and, and my friend was sitting next to them. And at the end of the service, this lady walked out and she says, I just can't stand all the smiling. Just what there's all the smiling about, you know? <laughs> Some people don't like that. They don't like the positivity, right? So I'm, I'm constantly asking myself, like, what's it like to be on the other? Not everybody's enjoying you. So what, 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 what are the things that are just like, like, especially with the people closest to you, that are driving them nuts? One time, Jackie and I went away on a little getaway to St. Louis, and we had this incredible conversation. It was a little awkward. I said, hey, honey, what's the thing that I'm doing that's just really driving you crazy? And at first, you know, my wife is so kind and so nice. She's like, oh, you're great. And I'm like, come on. You know, let's get through that. This is a real conversation here, right? And she says, well, you know... When, when, when you yell at the children, and our kids at that time were pretty small, when you yell at the children, it just, it just oh, scares them. And I'm like, I know, that's what I'm trying to do. 
Nobody puts their shoes away. Nobody puts their clothes away. I mean, nobody does anything, so I gotta yell. Anyway, she told me, she told me that it really, really, because her dad never yelled and her mom never yelled, and that's just not the type of home that she grew up in. And, you know, my mom is like this little Puerto Rican lady who just yelled a lot. <laughs> she got a lot of stuff done because she yelled, so I just kind of adopted her parenting style. Well, Jackie didn't like that, so I told her. I said, you know what? I, I, I won't do that. I won't do that. And from that, that was years ago, I said, I'm not going to raise my voice and yell at the kids. I had to use another strategy. I won't tell you what that was. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen to what Paul said in Ephesians. Listen to what he said. He said, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Did you know that that's supposed to be happening in your life? You are supposed to be getting rid of the thorns. Newsflash. You're supposed to be changing. You're supposed to be getting better as time goes on. Stop telling lies if you're a liar. Don't let anger control you. Like the, the, the anger in your life is repulsive to the people around you. I'm just telling you, if you don't know it, I'll tell you. Some of you ladies are like, thank you, Jesus. Speak through him. Holy Spirit, open my husband's heart. <laughs> your, gentlemen, your anger is crushing your family. Stop it. They don't enjoy it. They don't like it. They want you to leave, right? Don't let sin, uh, don't, let, don't sin by letting anger control you. If you're a thief, stop stealing. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one. If you use foul or abusive language, quit it. Listen, he continues, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words. He tries to, tries to sum it all up. Slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. You're supposed to be getting rid of your thorns. So what are we going to count? We're going to count the things. We're going to count the thorns that you eliminate. What if you eliminated one thorn per year? Do you realize in five years you'd be a completely different person? And the people in your life would be like, I don't know what happened. what's happened to my husband. I don't know what's happened to my wife. She's incredible. She used to be like this. Now she's like this. One a year, one thorn every 12 months, you'll be a completely different person in five years. Whoa. That's my goal as a husband, as a dad, as a pastor. It's like, how can I get better just one thing every single year? How about you? What have we said today? We've said a lot and I've tried to condense a lot of content into a small amount of time, but here's the gist of it. Like your, your life, the quality of your life right now is a result, a direct result of the four or five key relationships in your life today. In other words, if you're experiencing a lot of joy and a lot of peace, it's probably because you have a lot of good people. If you have a lot of toxicity, if you have a lot of broken relationships, a lot of tension between you and a lot of people, guess what? It's because of the relationships in your life. You need quality relationships in order to experience the life that God has planned for you. You need quality relationships in order to experience life in the kingdom, in order to be the Christ follower that he's called you to be. Think about it like this. What kind of pastor would I be for you, for you today, if the key relationships in my life are falling apart? Come on, I couldn't stand up here with any sort of integrity or credibility and say anything to you. If I'm at odds with my son, my daughter, if my wife is hating on me, if the staff member can't, staff can't stand me, if the elders of the church didn't like me, I couldn't stand here. Like I am standing here because of the people in my life. And those relationships require effort and consistency. Is this making sense? If you want to make a difference with your life in the kingdom, you've got to have great relationships. Oh, and by the way, you've got to have your finances in order. Oh, and by the way, you've got to have your health and fitness figured out. Oh, and by the way, your attitude needs to be really good. And that's why we've been talking about all these things in this series. So what are we going to count? What are we going to count today? We're going to count hours spent together, right? the priority. We're going to count value added, and we're going to count the things that, the thorns that we have to eliminate out of our lives. Man, take this stuff. Run with it and see if it doesn't work. As you leave today, I want you to, well, don't leave yet, but in a mo few moments, I want you to think through what grade you'd give yourself. What, would, what, what kind of grade right now on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 would be, man, 
everybody, I'm, I'm at odds with everybody in my life. Parents, coworkers, teammates, I'm on a basketball team, I'm on a volleyball, whatever you are, and I, teammates can't stand me. Teachers, I'm at odds with my teachers. That's like a, a zero or a one. 10 is, man, I've got to cancel friends. I've got so many friends, I can't even go out anymore. <laughs> People want to be my friend, you know, get on the list. That's like a 10. Where are you on a scale of one to 10? Be serious, give yourself a grade because the quality of your life really is the result of your closest relationships. Now, as we wrap up, I wanna go back to a verse in Titus I shared earlier. Titus chapter two, verse 14. Here's what it says. Jesus gave his life to free us from every kind of sin. Lying, cheating, adultery, all forms of sexual sin, greed, anger. He gave his life to set us free from that, to cleanse us, to wash us. The word there means to like take a stain out. Got a stain in a shirt, you wash it, stain comes out. That's what Jesus came to do. To make us his very own people. It's interesting. Jesus came to this earth, he gave his life to free us from our sins, to cleanse us, and to make us his people. What does that mean? That means that Jesus came to make you his son, if you're a man, his daughter, if you're a woman. That's what he came to do. And then out of this group of people, these men and these women, he wants us to be totally committed to adding value to everybody else around us. That's the story we find ourselves living in today. The reason you are saved today is to add value. Some of you haven't really gotten in the game. You haven't gotten in the game yet. You have not asked Christ to free you from your sin and to cleanse you. You are not yet one of his people. Maybe today is the day. You say, well, how would I do that? Do I need to join the church? Do I need to you know, get religious? No, no, you don't need to join the church. And this has nothing to do with religion. This has everything to do with becoming one of his people his son, his daughter. And you do that by expressing faith in Jesus, by reaching out to him and asking him to forgive you of your sins, by trusting him to be your savior. And if you're interested in doing that, if you feel led to do that, I'm gonna lead you in the prayer. It's a prayer of faith that says, Jesus, you, you're, you're it. You're the Lord, you're the savior. Wash me of my sins, cleanse me. I turn to you in faith. If you'd like to do that right now, whatever campus you're at, if you're watching online at home, if you're here at Greenwood, take these words I'm about to share. Turn them into your own words. Put them in your own sentences and talk to God right now and put your trust in Jesus. Will you pray with me? Just say this to him. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and gave your life to cleanse me from my sin to wash me clean, to set me free from all my sin, that I could be your son, your daughter. And so I put my trust in you today in the best way I know how, with what little faith I have, I ask you to be my savior. Forgive me of my sin put me on the right path. I'm choosing to trust you. And from this day forward, help me to add value to those around me, to be totally committed to good deeds, starting in my home with my friendships, my coworkers, and the rest of the world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, our church wants to celebrate with you. Amen. Come on, all of our campuses. If you did trust Christ today, we have a little starter kit we put together for you. We call it our saved box. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you text the word saved to 65248, we will get one of these in your hands at the information desk out at your, at your campus. Uh, there's a Bible inside here to, uh, with a reading plan, some information about small groups. By the way, today's the last day to sign up for small groups, which that's what this whole sermon was about. So I want to encourage you to do that. And there's also information here about baptism. So if you would text the word save to 65248, we'll get one of these in your hands. One more time, church. Can we give God glory? Amen. 
Hey, I'm gonna pray with us. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. Before we leave, this, this sermon was sort of like a precursor to our next series. Next week, we're starting a brand new series called Good Bones, and it's gonna be about all the important things that you need to build great relationships. So you're not gonna wanna miss that. I wanna encourage you to bring your friends next week. It's gonna be a fantastic series. Let's pray, and then I'll hand things off to the local teams. Lord, we love you. Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth to make us your own people, to cleanse us of our, from our sin, to be in a relationship with us, that we might become people who spread your love through good deeds, totally committed to adding value to the people around us. That help us to improve our relationships, God, by spending time prioritizing them, adding value, and eliminating the thorns out of our life. And we will give you all the glory and all the honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Right now, I'm gonna hand things off to the local teams. Love you guys, see you next week.